They muted us. They're not starting at seven. They can meet all they want to. <laughs> we're gonna have a pretty small class i think i think so yeah yeah i think i think the two of you are going to um bring us up by 20 percent. so is this spring break week for the schools yes it is for some my, my daughter's going to next year. I thought it was my daughter. Is anywhere you want it?
I called it her birthday. She goes, oh, wow, that's nice. There. There's a page of Hi. <laughs> well, the Bible says where two or three are gathered in my name. So. <laughs> it's always a good thing. I enjoy laughter. Me too. <laughs> Especially after reading your uh, book of those quotes. <laughs> <laughs> and there was this one guy with, you know, big curly white. He said, This is you. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> you know, it was funny because um, Brian made a comment during his sermon. He said, You know, I enjoy laughing and, you know, I'm, I'm really serious about my work, but I'm going to have a good time going to heaven. So, and I think that's just such a healthy attitude to have that um, the Bible, we, we look at that scripture in John 10 and 10, you know, and how the devil came to steal and kill, but that I'd be teaching this week. So we have a smaller group here, but that's okay. Um, as we just said, we're two or three are gathered in my name. So I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. Let's start with a word of prayer, please. Father in heaven, we, uh, we thank you for the day that you've given to us. Uh, we thank you for the rain that you've sent to us that uh, brings forth uh, the green and the beauty of, of the lands. Father, we thank you for watching over us and bringing us to this uh, class at this time to study a portion of your word. Lord, we, we are always thankful for your word and just pray that it will enrich us in a way that um, we will be more excited uh, with serving you, that we will look to our sacrificial life as one that is of, um, of joy, uh, not a burden. Um, we, we pray that you will bless each person that is here, that you'll open up all of our hearts and our minds to receive your word. And through it, Father, we will be uh, better servants of yours through your son, Jesus. Or in his name, we offer this prayer to you now. Amen. Amen. Question for you. Do our sacrifices need to be willing sacrifices? How do you feel about your sacrifices? We've been talking the last few weeks. Bill came up uh, the first week and he was talking about what is a sacrifice. And I remember um, I, I went back and watched all of them. Um, um, you needed the extra 30 bucks. And so she would take on this, this job um, just so that you could have the things that you needed. And, you know, so we, 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 
had a good start to this series of, of sacrifice. Um, and then we continued and, and, and Brad did a wonderful job then handed off to Roger. And, you know, we talk about the sacrifice of time and just how important, um, time is to us. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that tonight, but, you know, because time is not something you get back later. You know, you don't give up your time and then say, no problem. I'll just get those, those days back on the, on the tail end of the week. You know, you, you truly give those things away. Um, but when we think about our, our sacrifices, do they have to be willing? Do you feel that your sacrifices are willing? Say again. Scripture says, offer yourself as a willing sacrifice. Okay. All right. Any other comment there? Uh-oh. Do we have a mic going? This, this, there we go. Oh, yeah. Um, if it's not a willing sacrifice, then it's something that's being taken from you. It's not your, if it's not mm -hmm. within your will, I don't think it's sacrifice. I don't know. Okay. All right. Interesting. Yes, sir. It reminds me a little bit of what Billy Graham said once about sin. He said, "Sin, uh, avoiding sin that's not a temptation for you is not something you get any credit for. <laughs> so uh, I, I see this in the, same, in, in the same light. How can you say you've sacrificed if it's not willing? Uh, you know? Okay. Uh, I'll take a different approach. Uh, I think sometimes our sacrifices or our, our the, the things that we go through uh, that lead to sacrifice are teaching moments that God is giving or presenting to us to help us to grow. And so, no, they don't have to be, but they should be. Okay. Maybe you should define sacrifice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I see it as, yeah, they need to be willing. And if it's God's will, it, it means something. But if it's of man's will and you don't do it with a good attitude, it really means nothing. Mm -hmm. So they need to be willing to sacrifice. sacrifice. Okay. Okay. I, I wanted us to, you know, answer that question for ourselves and, you know, as those who are willing to um, respond openly. Um, because, you know, when we think about a sacrifice and we, we, we had the discussion in the, in the first couple of classes, we kind of touched on it with each class, but there's a huge difference between a sacrifice and an inconvenience, right? And a lot of times the things that we like to call sacrifices are really just inconveniences. You know, why sacrifice my time to go pick up sister so-and-so to bring her to church? And she's you know, 20 minutes out of the way. Is that really a sacrifice? It, 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 it could be, but it, it, it seems to be more of, you know, I, I, was, I was on a set path that I made up and somebody kind of took me off of that path, right? Um, when we think about sacrifice, you know, I want us to think about are we giving something up of ourselves? You know, like I said, a couple of weeks ago, Brad talked about time, things that we can't give back. And are we willing to make, um, are we willing to give that up knowing that we can't get it back? And the reason I bring that up is because I want us to think about our sacrificial living tonight and how we actually go about doing it. Um, as I said before and said in the prayer, sacrificial living should not be a burden. But in fact, we should be looking at it as a privilege. Sacrifice is a privilege because it allows us to show our love for God and for others. When we sacrifice, it is a statement of relative worth. OK, if you're taking notes, that's a good note to write down. It's a statement of relative worth. Uh, I want you to think about some 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 statements that you've probably heard before, uh, some catchphrases. Um, what you talking about, Willis? You guys know what that is? Yeah. Right, remember Arnold from Different Strokes? Different Strokes, right? Boss, boss, the plane, the plane. 
Fantasy Island. Yep, came on on Friday nights at 10 o'clock after the Love Boat, both of which I should not have been watching when they first came out, right? But I knew those. What about this one? A, the Fonz, the Fonz, right? I love it when a plan comes together. A team, Hannibal, right? Um, give me, give me, give me one a little bit harder. Oh, just one more thing. Colombo, there we go. And you know, it's funny because as we think about these phrases, we think about these statements that they make on TV. You know, when you listen to the actors talk afterwards, they say, you know, I'm just walking down the street and somebody would just walk up and repeat that phrase to me over and over again. I've become what? Synonymous with that phrase. Now let's think about that sacrificial living and how sacrifice is a statement of relative worth. It's our statement. Are we synonymous with the statement of sacrificial living? When someone sees us walking down the street, do they look at us and think immediately of, that's a person who's, whose life speaks of sacrificial living? That's kind of where we want to get to, don't, don't we? Don't we want to have that, that, that reputation that when someone sees us, they see God? When someone sees us, they see us as a willing participant in the area of sacrificial living. Okay, and that's what I want us to talk about tonight. Sacrifice, um, it requires that we understand that this thing of value, whatever we're sacrificing, um, regardless of whether it is ever going to be returned to us, like we talked about two weeks ago with the time, that this thing that we're sacrificing has less value than the people we're sacrificing for. Okay, it may be extremely valuable, and I would argue it should be extremely valuable, but it's still of less value than the person we're sacrificing for. Okay, now, a little philosophical question for you. If Christ knew he wasn't going to be raised from the dead, you think he would have still died for us? I know it, it's not even a possibility because the scriptures say from the beginning, we knew what he, he already knew what he was going to do. But just, just go with me here on this, this thought exercise. If Christ did not know that he would be raised from the dead, do you think he would have still died for us? There are many people who. There, for those who are online. Oh, sorry. There are many people who have died for us, knowing that they weren't going to rise from the dead. And I'm talking about soldiers and and people who gave their lives. Uh, firemen who rush into a burning building they don't know that they're going to be raised from the dead if they die but they go anyway mm -hmm. um police officers um a lot of people yeah and and that's true sacrifice in my being and what you said earlier i now that i have the mic i'm not going to give it back uh, <laughs> uh what you said earlier about having a reputation of being a willing sacrifice we have to be very careful that we have a reputation of being a willing sacrifice, but not being a soft touch. Not being a pushover, right? Yeah. Amen. <clears throat> I'm okay if people call me a pushover, if I'm doing what I know I should be doing. Some people have the wrong. They, everybody has the right to be wrong. How's that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but so you brought up, you brought up the idea of those who know they're not going to be raised from the dead. Um, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Okay. I was just wondering, do is it possible for us to sacrifice even? I mean, given our lives, yes. But beyond that, I'm not I'm I'm not sure if, for example, the term sacrificial giving, if it's all his, how can I give sacrificially? Mm. I, I'm not I don't know if that's possible. I don't know. I guess I could sacrifice, I could give something of, that I would, you know, I would not not buy something for myself or for my family because I had given so much to to God, let's say, but but I I don't 
I'm not entirely sure that's, I don't know if that's sacrificial or not. So he, he brings up a very good point. He says, you know, short of, of giving your life, how can we give something that already belongs to him to him and call it sacrifice? You know, and, that, and that's a good question. When we when we look at um, Romans chapter 12 and we talk about, you know, um, giving our bodies to be a living sacrifice. Right. We're not giving our our life, meaning giving up our life, but it is in through our living. We're giving something that we cannot get back. Right. And it is of extreme value. Do me a favor. Turn over to um, turn over to Matthew chapter nineteen. I have it in my notes here. Uh, turn over to Matthew nineteen. While you're doing that, I want us to think about um, the action of sacrifice. The action of sacrifice is difficult, right? Because we know the thing that um, may not ever come back to us. But here's why sacrifice is so important for us. Remember I said it's a statement of relative worth and that the thing we sacrifice may be valuable, but it's not as valuable as the thing we're sacrificing for. The action of sacrifice is difficult, but the thing that we sacrifice, we do it because of the hope of the greater purpose of the sacrifice. What do I mean by that? We may not like the sacrifice of money, for our child's education, especially when they say they want to go out of state, and you know you can pay in-state tuition, right? But we're always willing to sacrifice that for the good of the child. You see that the, the action itself is not always something that we enjoy, not always something that we want to do, but we always want to sacrifice. You see the difference there? And it's an important distinction that we have to make because we saw Christ in the garden saying, this process that I'm about to go through, if it's your will, I would rather not go through the process. But Christ never thought twice about sacrificing. He didn't like the idea of being beaten. He didn't like the idea of being tormented. He didn't like the idea of being tortured but he never thought twice about his sacrifice because of the love he has for us. In other words, the sacrifice itself was more valuable than what he was, he was giving up. And it, as soon as we start to realize that, some of the things that we call sacrifices, they may be painful, but the attitude of sacrifice always overpowers that, always overshadows it. So I want us to think about that as we look at Matthew chapter 19. We won't read through the whole thing. Uh, I think we have those who are, are pretty knowledgeable of this, this passage, 16, 16 through 30. Um, in fact, I think I put it up here. Yeah, Matthew chapter 19, 16 through 30. Um, I should not have made that red because I know that's probably really hard to see. Apologies for that. Don't make it blue either. Exactly. <laughs> Right. Someone comes up to Jesus and they say, you know, hey, what do I need to do to inherit, inherit eternal life, to have eternal life? And, you know, first thing Jesus says, why are you calling me good? Uh, there's no one good, but but one as God. And then he goes on to tell him what he should do. What did he tell him? This was really interesting. What did he tell him? What commandments, though? Did he give all of them? I, fo I found that very interesting reading this, what he gave him. He said, don't kill anybody. Don't cheat on your wife. Don't steal. Right. Don't lie. Honor your parents. And then he said one other thing, which I thought was really interesting. He said, love your neighbor. For all of our Bible scholars here. What commandment is love your neighbor? It's not in the list of 10. And I think that was intentional. I think that was intentional that he said that. 
Because yes, it, it's sort of in what he says, this new commandment I give to you, right? But again, he's talking to who? A Jew. And he's saying, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? So he gives them the Jewish background and he starts at basically the fifth one, right? He starts at the fifth one, he says, do all these things. And he even adds on there and love your neighbor, which by the way, was part of the law. Even though it wasn't part of the 10, we can go in Leviticus and we can see how he talks about loving your neighbor. Don't, you know, don't hate the, your countrymen. Um, and he, he brings that in with a bunch of other things too. Don't have two different um, seeds in the same field. He goes through these whole parts of the, the law, what you should do. But he throws this one in there that's not part of the 10, okay? And then it, what, what happens? The guy's feeling pretty good about himself, right? He says, I've observed all these things since I was a boy. He says, yes, you have, but there's one thing you lack. And then he tells him about the first four. You say, how, how, is, that, how is that so? He says, sell all your possessions. Give them to the poor and come follow me. And this man went away, says, sorrowful, for he had much. He had a lot of money. So to, to sell every, a lot of possessions, sorry, a lot of possessions. So to get rid of all that stuff would have been a big, what, sacrifice for him. Okay. And then Jesus turns to his disciples and knows we're there and he talks about how it is difficult for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. By the way, what he's saying is very improbable. He's not saying it's impossible. I won't do it for Kathy's sake to talk about a process for getting the camel through the eye of a needle, but it is possible. Uh, <laughs> but the rest of the disciples said, then who can make it? He says, with man, it's impossible. When you're trying to do it on your own, you can't do it. But with God, it's possible. Why is this so important? Remember what he left out in those the commandments? First one is what? Have no other God before me. How do you think he was doing on that one? What's the second one? What was the second one? No idols, no graven images. How's he doing with that one? Not so good. What about the third one? Remember what the third one was? Say again. Not quite. That's the fourth one. But you know, we're right, we're gonna get to that one too. But the third one was what? He said, Don't take my name in vain. Vain is what? It's emptiness of no value. What did Christ just tell him to do? He says, master, good master, what do I need to do to, eternal, to gain eternal life? And they get to it and Jesus himself, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The word just tells him, God just tells him, after you do all this stuff, come follow me. And he walked away. Do you think he kind of thought of God as empty? You think there was a value statement that he made when he walked away from the word of God, when he walked away from God himself? His words didn't mean enough to him to actually do what God is telling him to do. So, Jesus was intentional about this. And we're going to get to, by the way, this class is about Hebrews chapter, the second part of Hebrews, and we're going to get to that. But it, all of that is plays into this, because if we don't understand what we talk, what we mean when we say sacrifice, he was basically saying, I don't want to make that sacrifice because the thing that I'm sacrificing has more value to me than the thing that I would get from it. Now, none of us would actually say that out loud. How many of us are going to say, 
No, I think my stuff is worth more than God. Now, he, he's not going to come back, so you don't have to worry about being put to this test. He's not going to come back and say, everybody here at the Brooks Avenue Church, sell all your stuff and give it to the poor and come follow me. He's already told you to come follow you, him, right? But if he did, will we joyfully do it or sorrowfully do it? Remember, we were asking earlier, are, does the sacrifice have to be willing sacrifice? Are we like, ah, this is... I don't want to do it. I guess I'll do it because everybody else around me is doing it. I mean, I saw Sharon just gave gave hers, so I should do it too. I can't look worse than Sharon. I got I got to show her up, right? We may be challenged by this, and this is what was going on with the rich man: is that he saw something that was valuable because he went and asked him about it. Christ didn't go and evangelize to him. He went to Christ and said, "What do I need to do?" He said, here, do this. That's, that's what, too much. All right, think about that one as we get to this part. Anyone can be a moral person, and many people actually can attribute uh, their morality to being godly, okay? But if our lives are not devoted to God, we can't truly understand godly or sacrificial living. Simply put, we know a lot of people who are willing to live morally. We know a lot of people in the church who are willing to live morally. But are you doing it for yourself because you've raised yourself up to the point of God? Do they do it themselves? We're not talking about anybody here. It's just the people that are not here. Um, <laughs> are, we, are we thinking about raising the self up to look good in front of people? Or are we looking to raise God up in all of that we do? I know a lot of moral people. I, you know, I, I, I shared with some of you, you know, um, I, I moved in with, with the Beckemeyers, uh, Maureen and Denny, when I was 17 years old. They're a family of a friend of mine. And when I go home to Seattle, that's home for me. They are some of the kindest, most giving people I have ever met. Truly. Their focus, however, is not doing this thing for the sake of God. And I think they have wonderful worldly motives. You know, I don't think they have an evil bone in, in their body in the sense of anything malicious about them. Right. But when we think about being having a sacrificial life, our sacrifice should be towards God or for the purpose of pleasing God. We're going to talk about how we actually please him in a second when we get down into to Hebrews. So anybody can be that moral person. Uh, we look at that man in, in Matthew chapter 19 and we see how, you know, he broke some of those early laws. He had a desire for eternal life, but he didn't see it as valuable as himself or his possessions. Because the other thing he he was told was after you sell all that, you don't have an opportunity to go and make it back the way you did the first time. And by the way, I truly believe that he was an honest businessman. Why do I believe that? Well, because he said he has observed all the laws since he was a boy, which means he didn't steal, he didn't covet, and he didn't lie. You don't see a lot of businessmen today with those three things missing <laughs> and are extremely rich but he said now i want you to come follow me so all the things you used to do you know i need you to give those up for some amount of time and come follow me so you can't just go out and sell out i'll make it back next week no big deal he says my time is valuable i'm valuable and I just can't follow God because I'm too valuable for that. That's how he's looking at his, that sacrifice he's being asked to make. Now turn over to Hebrews chapter 10. I want us to think about that because in Hebrews we, we see um, a description of how Christ 
gave himself on the cross. And we get to Hebrews chapter 10. I want you to look at starting at verse 35. Before we get to the, ver the chapter that we all are aware of with Hebrews chapter 11, and we're going to get to that. First, we see Christ and the sacrifice he made and how he is now the, the priest uh, for us. And we have this altar. We're going to talk about that a little bit later if we have time that we can go to. It talks about cast not away your confidence. The man in, in, in Matthew he was sorrowful because he didn't see the reward being greater than what he would lose. If we're not careful, a lot of times we can walk around as Christians sorrowful, not because we don't mentally know we haven't. It's not that we haven't read it. But at that moment, there's a sense that, you know. This is just. A lot. And by the way, I don't want to I don't want us to confuse the idea of being sorrowful um, as being against God. There are there are times when we know you don't have to be happy to be joyful. Let me put it that way. Are we can we agree to that? Right. You don't have to be happy to be joyful. You can recognize where your joy comes from. And even in the worst times, you can acknowledge the fact that, yes, this is a bad time but it's one that I'm going through and God's going through it with me, right? But don't cast it away. The confidence that you have in him, don't throw it to the side so now you don't even see that hope because that's where the hope comes from. I put in here three different um, versions, King James Version, cast not away your, therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. It, it sounds nice and flowery, but I kind of like the, Bible in basic English, don't give up your hope, which will be greatly rewarded. The thing that you have, that hope, is going to be rewarded in the end. You may have the NIV, so don't throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. And then verse 36, for you have need of patience or you need, wait, you need to wait. You need to persevere. What does persevere mean? There's a, there's a strain, there's a striving but there's some resistance to it, right? Um, in life, we're gonna have some resistance. But if we want the reward, the sacrifices we're making is just going in spite of the resistance because we see something greater and we need that patience. And in verse 38, and I didn't mean to um, skip over verse 37, um, but I wanted to get to verse 38. Now the just shall live by faith, or but the upright man will be living by his faith, but my righteous one will live um, by faith. It's this expected hope that we have in heaven that allows us to give up those things that we perceive as valuable. Nothing else is going to get us to do that. If I thought, and I'll be honest with you, if I thought paying $20,000 a year, $30,000, $50,000 a year for my child to go to school so that he can work over at Bojangles, I may not be so willing to make that sacrifice, right? And it's not even because of, of Bojangles. It's, uh, it's the fact that he may not be or she may not be. I'm not trying to just throw my sons under the bus here. At their best place in life. Don't we want the best for our children? Yes. Right. And if we if if your child came up to you and said, I want to go to Columbia and get a business degree so I can be a manager at Bojangles. And I see the faces of, of you looking there going, yeah, that's not going to happen. Right. You can go to Columbia Community College um, <laughs> and get the same thing. <laughs> yeah, you can go to Bojangles first and get a job and pay for it wherever you want to go. Yeah, you know about our children. It's the same thing that Mike knows about up 
Yes. He's not made his final decision. He's working his way, figuring out what he's going to do. And I, you know, I wasn't, I was, we were, well, I was hard to take it for. I was very hard on our son who skipped class to mow lawns when he was at David Lipson College in about a day in math, which is what he does things. I'm sorry, I, for those who may be online. <laughs> <laughs> David didn't know that. He only told mom that one. I said I was very hard on our son when he was going to David Lipscomb and he skipped math class and another one to mow lawns so it'd have some change. We were sending change. We were sending him pocket money. So when he came home, I just didn't say, well, son, you got to do better. I set him down at the kitchen table, showed him how much it cost for three hours at David Lipscomb College and how much money he made mowing lawns and he didn't near meet the bar. And so <laughs> I said, we're not doing this again. Uh, I said, this is a sacrifice for your dad and me. And it was, uh, he did graduate from college, graduated at NC State uh, with a great, great grade point average. But I think we were so hard on our children and I think we need to look back and see what has God, what kind of grace has God given us for the things that we do that we, he does not want us to do? Um, and, you know, we need to give our kids time to mature. That's what we need to do. And not all of them mature at the same rate. Very true. Very true. They always mature slower. They always mature a little bit slower than we want them to, but they always mature exactly how God has them. So then we get into, so for the sake of time, um, then we get into Hebrews chapter 11. And this is, the, this is the chapter that we all kind of love. It starts off, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Right. And then we look at Hebrews 11 and 6, and we like using this scripture when we're talking about the the I'm putting it quote, the, the five um, steps to salvation. Right. Without for without faith is it impossible to please him for he that cometh to God. What must believe that he is. This is the part that we need to always remember and is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If your sacrifice is more than the reward that he has, then you won't you won't give it up. Right. Because God is the rewarder here, not the people that you may be sacrificing for, not the kids, not the spouse, not the stranger down the street that, you know, you gave two dollars to because you found it in your. Um, they used to be the ashtrays. What are they called now? I don't even know what they're called because no one smokes, but they used to be. They don't have lighters either. Right. <laughs> but we see it in there. So we say, I'm going to sacrifice this. Right. He is the rewarder. The only way we will sacrifice for that reward is if we see that reward greater than what we're sacrificing. Going back to Matthew, he didn't see that. Looking at us today, our sacrifice, and you can ask yourself this, I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand, I'm not gonna ask you to come down to the, the front pew and, and repent. I just wanted you to think about for yourself, Do I not sacrifice because I see that that thing that I would sacrifice is more valuable than God? Now, of course, again, we never use those words, but something for us to think about. But then the rest of Hebrews chapter 11, he goes into the Hall of Fame, what we call the Hall of Fame of faith. Right. And, and we see um, we see the examples of of of. Um, Noah, we see the example of Moses or Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. And uh, it goes down the line. We see all these great examples. But then Hebrews 12 comes. And it says. Hebrews 12 and one, you get to it. Being. Or wherefore, seeing we are also compassed encircled about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Who are the witnesses? All these who demonstrated their faith. All these who showed a level of sacrifice because they saw what was greater in front of them than uh, above them than what was in front of them. 
being that we're surrounded by all of this. And I love the fact that he even says a, a cloud of witnesses. So no matter which direction you look, as long as you're looking up, all you can see are this cloud of witnesses. All you can see are those who were showing faithfulness. If we're looking toward God, you're gonna always see faithfulness. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us. This one always gave me trouble. This verse always gave me trouble because it's not lay aside, you know, uh, as as Roger said, if it, if it's a sin that sin that's not, um, what did you say, a temptation? Yeah, if you're not tempted by, I'm. I have a beautiful wife. The last thing that's going to tempt me is another beautiful woman, because I feel in my heart of hearts I have the most beautiful one at home. So that's not my temptation, and I'm not saying that just because you're watching. Hey, baby. It's not my temptation. But y'all know how much I love my red vines. Vines with a V, right? Not Vino, not red. <laughs> yeah, my red vines. There are some temptations that it doesn't even have to try hard when it comes around me for me to fall for it. Those are the ones that easily beset us. Not just the ones that get to us, the ones that we struggle with. I'm talking about the sins that we don't struggle with. The sins that, oh, it's here? Okay. That's the one that he's talking about here. And guess what? You have them too. The only reason I may not have some of the ones that I used to have is because I'm too old to have them now. Okay. But there is a sin that so easily, that easily gets to us. It may be pride. It may be our money. It may be our commitment to our jobs. It may be our um, unhealthy devotion to our family. We're willing to give up God for them. But there is something that gets to us, but we're circled by a great cloud of witnesses. And it says it's time to lay aside those things. And it says, once you lay them aside, now run. Run with patience, right? And we can go back to 1136 and look at patience, or 1036, sorry. Running implies what? A level of urgency, right? Run implies um, a level of urgency. A race implies direction and goal. I ran the 400, and we started on the curve, and we ran and got tired and had you know everything lock up, and we ended up back where we started. Right, one of the most frustrating races. Run as hard as you can, you end up where you start. If I took off the other way, this is gonna be a problem, right? And no matter how hard I run, there's no way I'm gonna win that race going that direction. There's a race, which means, and it has a direction. And it's set before us, implies there are some rules there. We didn't create this race, but we have to follow the rules that are there. OK, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus implies the experienced coach. And I like using track because I, I ran track as well. It, Jesus is not only my coach. He's someone who's been there and done that. Right. Bought the T-shirt. He's also the lanes. You know, in, in the relay, sometimes you run on the outside of the lane. Uh, and you hand off to the person on the inside when they go on the turn, but you're always in your lane. Jesus is that lane. And he's also the finish line. So when we run this race with a level of urgency, with Christ as our guide and Christ as our finish line, then all those other things, we should be willing to give up. We should be willing to lay aside. Anyone ever tried to run with weights on? Right. You probably did as a training method. Right. Um, we had in, in track, we had the parachutes. Right. And the, the faster you run, the more that parachute kind of pulls and there's resistance there. And the idea is that when you take it off. You're running faster. Sometimes we're in the actual race, not in the training. And we're still trying to run with the weights that are on us. 
and God is letting us know you need to lay it aside. Christ gives us the example that he endured. Again, the fact that he endured means that there was a struggle. There was a struggle there. He endured, which meant uh, his sacrifice was not enjoyable. Look at verse 11 in that one. But the hope of the greater purpose of the sacrifice made him willing. So here's what I want us to discuss in the last 10 minutes. I want us to get through that because um, I want us to think about how do we do it? Hebrews 12 and 13, um, pursue peace. Just really quickly, I'll give you uh, some of those scriptures. Uh, how do we do it? Pursue peace, 12 and 14. Practice brotherly love, 13 and 1. Pursue fruitful relationships. Have good conversation. Have meaningful conversation with one another, 13 and 5. Respect learning of God's word and those who teach it, 13, 7, and also 17. I don't have time to go into that one. That's a lesson by itself. Maybe I'll hand that one to Brian for later. Intentionally and continuously praise God with our lips. You remember before at the beginning of class, I talked about our sacrifice is a statement. I've, I've heard people say, and Roger and I have talked about this before, where they say, you know, I, um, I, I speak about Christ wherever I go, and sometimes I use words or something to that effect. You know, and I always hated that phrase. You know, as if our life can just magically say, you must be a Christian. We cannot rely on people's perception to know that Christ is living in our lives. We need to share people with people Christ. Praise him with our lips and all things that we do. Now, you don't always have to say, let's sit down and have a Bible study for them to see Christ. But you should always be praising Christ with your lips as well as with your life. Okay, so intentionally and continuously praise, praise this to God with our lips, 13 and 15 and then have a perpetual openness to God's will in all that you do, verse 21. Here's a question for you then, with that in mind. What are the weights that easily beset us? And I really shouldn't have asked that question that way. What I should have said is, what are the weights that can easily beset you? You guys know my rule in, in the classes. It's not a generic thing, it's not a, this thing that's over here, but it's with us. What are some weights that can beset? Worrying about my sacrifice. <laughs> Worry. Am I doing enough? Is this really the sacrifice that you know that that God is pleased with? That can get to us, and you know. Satan is good at that. We, we talked with, you know, Laura, I think was here a few weeks ago and talked about, you know, Satan really getting to her and making her feel as if she's not worthy, you know, and the wonderful answer to that. And just so in case anybody else is wondering that is no, you're not. As a person, as you yourself, but with Christ, all things are possible, right? We are nothing but. I don't want to use that phrase of filthy rags because uh, it, it talks about something else with our works, but we, there is none good. No, not one, Christ says. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we're all short, but we become worthy in Christ because God sees Christ in us. So worry is one. Anything else? Anything else that can hold us back, thwart us, I think the the is the meaning of that word be set comfort comfort john collins wrote a book called um from good to great and it was a business book and it talks about the enemy of great is good we get so comfortable in having enough that we stop striving fear what kind of fear or your all your money or life i mean you stop yeah this thing is an old is in there yeah when you start to have more month at the end of the money huh yeah yeah <laughs> that's that's that that worry part too yeah absolutely 
we start thinking about the things that are here. And even though the Bible says, and again, when I say these scriptures, they're not anything you haven't heard before, right? Um, though our outward man perish, the inward man is renewed day by day. And yet we spend a lot of time worrying about that outward man that's perishing. He already told you it's going to perish and we worry about it perishing. You don't have to worry about that. It's going to happen. You either will get older or you won't. Which choice do you want? Which one you want? Right? So <laughs> worry, fear, comfort, the physical life. Yeah. Meaning like just the things around us. Our health. Okay. A lot of things that are, are holding us back. And again, these are things that are thwarting us from running that race without that weight on us. This is the weight that keeps us down. Okay. Do we still try to run with the weights though? We say, I know these weights are here. I'm just going to fight through it. But what does Jesus tell us when he says, Come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. What does he say? Lay your burdens. These things that are weighing you down. These things that are so heavy. These weights. I'm going to carry them for you. Lay your burdens. And take up my yoke. Why? Why should I take up your yoke, Jesus? Because it's easy and my burden is light. The race that we're running, our spiritual race that we're running, can either be hampered by the weight of all these worries, these sins that so easily thwart us, or you can be flying through by letting Jesus hold on to it. Now, what do I mean by flying through? I don't mean that everything is coming easy. Right. I don't want us to think of it as saying, I don't have anything to worry about. What we're saying is the strength of Jesus in me is greater than anything that can hold me back. Right. And I want I don't want us to forget that. So do we try to run with the weights? Yeah, we do. But starting off before we even start running, it says take off those weights. Think about the weights that you have. What can you do to help remove um, those weights? What are some things that you can offer to others to help remove their weights? Because, you know, part of it is after you've had a chance to remove the weights or even as you're doing it. You know, sometimes we like to say, you know, how can I tell somebody else when I'm still dealing with issues? What are you dealing with? How are you dealing with them? You think somebody else can benefit from dealing with their issues the same way you're currently dealing with yours? Share your, burdens. Share your burdens. How do we actually go about helping others remove their weights? How would you do it, Sharon? Somebody's, somebody's coming and they're saying, you know, I, I would love to be a more faithful um, Christian, but I'm dealing with X. Do you just say get over it? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I like picking on Sharon because she's right in the front, but she's, I keep her out of arm's length, you know, case. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I guess the first thing would, the first thing I would do is find out what X is. Okay. Because it makes a lot of difference. If it's a personal, um, spiritual thing, I would pray with them. I would ask God to let them share and um, try to point them in the right passages to read and, and offer to help. If it's physical, I guess that I would, first thing what I would say, okay, what can I do to help? Yeah. Sounds like there's some relationship building going on there. 
Anyone else? Um, I'll share some, a, a thought process that helps me, which is Paul in Second Corinthians 4. We, therefore, we do not lose heart. Though our outward man is, per is perishing, our inward man is being renewed. And it's, it's a process, a mindset of looking beyond the things that are seen because those are temporary and looking at the things that are not seen in the situation, in the difficulty, in the struggle, things that are not seen um, because those are the things that are eternal. And just being able to, it's, a, it's difficult for us humans, maybe impossible for us humans, but to, to, to take a mindset of setting aside the things that we see with our eyes so that we can see what the eternal things are in, in every situation. Amen. Any other thoughts on that? You guys remember, um, I hope I get it right. If it's not, then it's someone else. Nehemiah. What, what do we know about Nehemiah? What was kind of his, quote, big accomplishment? Rebuilding the wall. And do you remember after he, he you know, he was sorrowful and he um, was walking around the king and he was doing something that was um, that could easily lead to his death. And that is looking sad in front of the king. And the king said to him, what man, what's wrong with you? And he, he tells him the story and he says, I'll tell you what. I'm going to write you this letter and let you go ahead, take a leave and take care of what you need to take care of. And when you're done come back here. Now what's read in between the lines? Because when I see you again, you better not have that look on your face. I'm just, I'm just, you know, offering a little commentary in between the lines there. Right. And then when he gets there and the people are asking him, now there were some people who were knuckleheads and they were fussing against him. But to those others, you know what he said to them? He said, let us go build the wall. Oftentimes, the, if we want to help somebody else get rid of that weight, we need to do it with them. If you've ever been to the gym and had free weights, you know it's always good to have what? A spotter. Because there are some times when that weight is too heavy for an individual to, li to lift. But when you have somebody there with you, nowadays, you know, they have all the technology where you push a button and it, it releases the weight on these electric ones. I, I, I think that's fascinating, but you get the point. Sometimes we need to have somebody there with us. It's not a matter of you saying, Don, I, I'm going to pray and I hope you get through that. But it's a matter of going to them and saying, I'm going to help you bear this weight. Because we're going through it, not into it. We're going through it. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, we were, as we're talking about sacrifice, uh, it makes me think about people who, you know, because when I became a Christian, it was kind of like my mom and dad were Christians and everybody's happy you became a Christian, but that's not necessarily the reality for people you might meet that they may not want that for this person. And, and I think about that being such a huge sacrifice because in some senses they have to actually give up their family. So while we're talking to them and encouraging them, you know, certainly we want to have the wisdom to walk with them and become family to them. So it's, it's as they're sacrificing, we need to be able to make the same types of sacrifice. Thank you for that, because as we wrap up, that's why I want us to bring it back uh, to the beginning of it. When we think about the sacrifices we're making, it may not always be easy, but the value of the sacrifice is always greater than what we're giving up. We said that at the beginning of the class, we said it in the middle, and we, I wanted to say it again at the end, because it's important for us. When we are volunteering our time, when we're volunteering our effort, when we're volunteering um, time that's taken away from something else that's very important. 
that sacrifice, we become a willing, was it sacrificer? Um, what's the word? Person of sacrifice? I don't know. <laughs> we become, we, we, we willingly sacrifice. There we go. We willingly sacrifice because we recognize what we're sacrificing for is greater than what we're giving up. And as long as we maintain that attitude, as long as we take, maintain that mindset, we're going to find our lives being one of sacrifice. Again, I want us all to walk away so that we can see our lives not as a moment of sacrifice. If I talk about, if I say, hey, give me a, an example of sacrifice, and then a month later I ask you that same question, and a year later I ask you that same question, and you keep coming back to the same thing that you did five years ago, we have to wonder, are you living a life of sacrifice or did you have a moment of sacrifice? We want to get to the point where we are living a life of sacrifice, where we're making daily statements that show our love for Christ and our love for others. Roger, we're going to close out. You know, this dovetails nicely with what uh, Brad talked about uh, a couple weeks ago about time. Because I think, I think we have a harder time, harder, different, harder time with time. Uh, I have a harder, a harder time managing our time than anything. And it, it ends up being the most precious thing. I, I can speak for myself. It, it becomes the most precious thing to us. And, and it's our, sometimes our uh, stinginess <laughs> with our time that keeps us from being the people that we should be and, and certainly from being disciple makers uh, because we, we, when we talk about disciple making, we talk about evangelism particularly, sometimes we get, we ra get wrapped up in content and process and we forget that we, that we are investing in lives. Yeah. And, and that takes time. Yeah. That takes a part of us. We have to invest time that we would spend doing something else in that life to help them deal with whatever their issues are that, that keep them from, maybe it's just ignorance in some cases, keep them from accepting Christ, from accepting the things that are the solutions to the problems that they have. And, but, but it takes a willingness on our part to sacrifice our time for them to invest our time in them and it's noticeable right think about the um the samaritan the good samaritan think about the person who's on the side of the road what they thought of the first two who walked by they didn't have time to even check to see how bad of a safe i was in i could just sprain my ankle and was down in the ditch one of them thought he was dead so he looked pretty bad they didn't even have time to look at me they didn't have time to even call somebody and say, hey, there's a guy down in the ditch. I can't touch him, but maybe you can help him. Just invest into that time, the sacrifice of time for that, good, that Samaritan made all the difference in his life, the Samaritan's life, but definitely the person he sacrificed for. He did all the sacrifices. Yes. So we're closing out. Who are the spiritual witnesses or examples that help you with your sacrifice, sacrificial life? I just want you to give some thought to that. OK. Uh, we think about all the witnesses that are around us. What do you who do you. Who do you think about as looking at you when you're sacrificing? Who are those witnesses? And then the secret to sacrificial living is. I was going to stop right there and just close this out, but I decided to add another slide here. Make intentional and continuous statements of faith. We talk about sacrificial living as a statement of faith, uh, proclaiming the value, praising God with your lips and with your daily living, sometimes because of and other times in spite of life. Better than any sacrifice we can give. Amen. Amen. Bring to First Samuel 15. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this time. Thank you for your words. Uh, thank you for the hearts of those who are here, those who are online as well. May you be with us and help us to make these statements of faith. May you bless us that we will have a life of sacrifice. As, as your word states, uh, may we be that living sacrifice. 
uh, being being conformed uh, by the renewing of our minds. May you guide us in the way we should go so that we will um, see this not as a burden, but as a privilege, as one that you have given to us that we may serve you and serve others better. Let us take that privilege and go throughout our days this week, uh, striving to um, find more and more opportunities uh, to live that life that you would have us to live. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all.